Muslim Center and the author of many books on Islam, Jihad, and ISIS, including the New York Times bestsellers, The Truth About Muhammad, and The Politically Incorrect Guide to Islam and the Crusades. Spencer is also a weekly columnist for Human Events and Front Page Magazine and has led seminars on Islam United States Central Command, United States Army Command and General Staff College, the U.S. Army's Asymmetric Warfare Group, the FBI, the Joint Terrorism Task Force, and the U.S. Intelligence Community. So we have someone who is informing people at the highest level of our government coming here to also inform you on um, some of these new threats that our nation is facing. Spencer has also written well over 300 articles about ISIS, Jihad, and Islamic terrorism. His latest book is called The Complete Infidel's Guide to ISIS. Um, and his books have been translated into many languages, including Spanish, Italian, Finnish, and Bahasa Indonesia. His articles on Islam and other topics have appeared in many publications, including the New York Post, Washington Times, Dallas Morning News, Middle East Quarterly, National Review Online, as well as many other journals. In addition to his seminars and writings, Spencer has led uh, a discussion on jihad, Islam, and terrorism at a workshop sponsored by our U.S. State Department and the German Foreign Ministry. He has appeared on numerous television uh, programs on the BBC, CNN, Fox News, PBS, NBC, MSNBC, and C-SPAN, and on numerous other radio programs. And while he is out uh, doing the important work of informing many Americans on uh, the issues and ISIS, jihad, and Islamic terrorism today, we are very fortunate to have him right here with us to speak with you. So please pay attention and have some great questions. Join me in welcoming Mr. Robert Spencer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There is a huge disagreement right now that you may be aware of between Barack Obama and Vladimir Putin of Russia. And Barack Obama says that the way to defeat the Islamic State, or ISIL as he calls it, and ISIS as everybody else calls it, is to remove Bashar Assad, the dictator of Syria, who now controls only a small portion of southern Syria at all anyway. And Putin says, on the contrary, the way to defeat the Islamic State is to keep Assad in power and fight against the Islamic State. How can we evaluate who is right? This question goes right back to another core disagreement that Obama and Putin have. And that is on the question of, is the Islamic State Islamic? You may have heard the president say that the Islamic State, or ISIL as he calls it, is neither Islamic nor a state. But the question, is the Islamic State Islamic, would be kind of like, is the Pope Catholic, were it not for the fact that he keeps saying that it isn't. And it matters so deeply, as is illustrated by the substance of his disagreement with Vladimir Putin. Because this is what's at stake. If the Islamic State is not Islamic, then what is it? It's got to be something else. It's got to be something. So what is it? Obama says it's a resistance movement against Bashar Assad. And so that makes sense of his whole position, that if it's just a resistance movement against Assad, if we take out Assad, then ISIS will melt away. If, on the other hand, the Islamic State is Islamic, then it might have a reach and a resonance far beyond whether Assad is in power or not. And so you see, your core assumptions, what you, the, the kinds of conclusions that you come to, the kind of analysis that you use when you are looking at a problem, is going to make a very big difference in what kind of solution you're going to come to. And this is the core of the disagreement between Obama and Putin. One of them says the Islamic State has something very much to do with Islam, and so if Assad were gone, the Islamic State will keep going. And the other one says, no, the Islamic State has nothing to do with Islam. And so if Assad is gone, it will melt away into nothingness. Now, in the first place, when we try to determine who's right on this, we should look at what the Islamic State says about itself. And you may have noticed that I keep calling it the Islamic State. Why do I keep doing that? Because that's its name. The word, the names ISIS and ISIL come from its old name that it discarded on June 29th, 2014. The words ISIL, I mean the, the acronyms, ISIL and ISIS, stand for the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. The Levant is the area of the Eastern Mediterranean, comprising Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, and the surrounding areas, Syria. 
The word in Arabic for Levant is Shams, which obviously starts with an S. And so you get ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Shams, or the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. The president, for whatever reason, prefers the latter and calls it ISIL, I-S-I-L, based on the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant. Those are the letters, I-S-I-L. Everybody else calls it ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Shams. It's essentially the same thing. It's just whether you're translating that word Shams into English, which would be Levant, or not. However, also unspoken in all this is the fact that that is no longer the name of the group. The group changed its name to the Islamic State, period, full stop, nothing else, the Islamic State, on June 29th, 2014, when it proclaimed itself to be the new caliphate. Now, what's a caliphate? A caliphate is, in Islamic theology, in the understanding of the religion of Islam, the only legitimate government to which all Muslims worldwide owe allegiance. And on June 29th, 2014, the Islamic State said, we're it, we're the caliphate. There has not been a caliphate. There was always a caliphate throughout Islamic history up until 1924, when the last caliph was removed and the caliphate was abolished by the secular Turkish government. And for 90 years, there was no caliph and no caliphate. Now, 2014, June 29th, the Islamic State declares itself the new caliphate. Now, you understand, that's a momentous declaration because what they're saying is, is that Muslims in France, in Germany, in Poland, in Russia, in uh, the United States, in Canada, everywhere else, they do not owe any allegiance to the governments of their countries, as that also goes for Muslims in Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Kuwait, Egypt, wherever. They only owe allegiance to the Islamic State. It transcends all national allegiances, transcends all ethnic identities, everything. And so, did anybody buy this? Did anybody believe this? Well, as of the latest reports, 30,000 Muslims from around the world, 30,000, have traveled from whatever country they were in to Iraq and Syria to join the Islamic State. And now the Islamic State, or ISIS and ISIL, they control a territory larger than Great Britain in which there are upwards of 8 million people. And so this is a considerable force. And people are buying it. People are taking seriously their claim to be the new caliphate. Why are they doing that? Well, one thing the people, the 30,000 people who have traveled to the Islamic State have in common is that they're all Muslims. And here again, this might seem to be, well, that's obvious. Well, duh. But wait a minute. The president says the Islamic State is not Islamic. And not only the president, but the vice president, the secretary of state, the prime minister of Great Britain, the prime minister of France, every Western leader in every country in Western Europe and the United States and Canada, they all say ISIS has nothing to do with Islam. And yet 30,000 Muslims disagree and have traveled to Iraq and Syria to join it. The other thing we have to look at in order to answer this question of is the Islamic State is Islamic, and thus to understand who is right, Putin or Obama, as to what we should do in Syria with Assad, is to look at what Islam actually teaches. And for that, I hope you all brought your Qurans. I have mine with me. I don't leave home without it. The Quran, of course, is the holy book of Islam. And the Islamic State often makes reference to it. You may recall seeing or hearing about, preferably hearing about, some of the beheading videos that the Islamic State put out, in which they would, with great uh, technical skill, depict the beheadings of various people, some Western hostages, some Ethiopian Christians, some Libyan Christians, various others. And they would very graphically show the beheadings. The world was repulsed. The world was horrified. And even Al-Qaeda, another jihad terror group, had enough and said, you know, you guys are turning people off with this. You really should cut out the beheading videos. You're just alienating people and making them mad at you. Now, why on earth would the Islamic State want to do that? Why would they keep putting out these videos when they did horrify and disgust the world? The answer is in the Quran itself. Chapter 47, verse 4, you can turn to it. Chapter 47, verse 4 says, When you meet the unbelievers, strike the necks. Strike the necks. Behead them. It's very clear. Chapter 8, verse 12 says the same thing, that Allah will send angels to strike the necks of the unbelievers. So when the Quran says this, 
and the Islamic State does it, and then there are Muslims who believe that the Quran is the perfect, unaltered, and unalterable word of Allah, the supreme and only God, then what kind of an effect is that going to have on them? Are they going to be shocked and horrified? No, they're not going to be shocked and horrified. They're going to think at last somebody is doing what the book says. Somebody is doing what the book tells us to do when we meet the unbelievers. Strike the necks. So this, these must be the authentic, this must be the authentic group. Another thing that the Islamic State does is persecute Christians. You may or may not have heard that when they took over Mosul, a very considerable city in Iraq, they painted the nun on the doors or the walls of the homes of Christians. A nun is an Arabic letter, it's letter N essentially, that is the first letter of the word Nazarene, which is the Quran's word for Christians. It calls the Christians Nazarenes all through the Quran, as in Jesus of Nazareth. And so when they were painting this letter N on the homes of the Christians, they were marking them for a particular reason. And that is because the Quran says, and this is chapter 9, verse 29, fight against those who do not obey Allah and his messenger and do not forbid what he has forbidden, even if they are of the people of the book, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now, there's a lot in that, so let's stay on that for a minute. Fight against those who do not obey Allah and his messenger, the messenger being Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. And do not forbid what he has forbidden, even if they are of the people of the book. The people of the book is the Quran's term for primarily Jews and Christians, because in the Quran's view, Jews and Christians and some others have received genuine revelations from God, but have dared to alter them, to change the Islamic character of them. So you may not know, if you come from a Christian or Jewish background, that Moses and Noah and Abraham, as well as John the Baptist and Jesus, they were all Muslims, and they all taught Islam. And then their followers twisted and hijacked their teachings to create Judaism and Christianity. That is the mainstream Islamic view. So the Jews and Christians are considered people of the book. They've received a legitimate revelation, but they have to be punished for having altered it to stray from Islam. And so the way they're punished, the verse goes on. Even if they are of the people of the book, until they pay the jizya, jizya means tax in Arabic, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. And the jizya is a very particular tax because in Islamic law, the Jews and Christians have to pay it, the people of the book have to pay it, the Muslims don't have to pay it. It's a special tax that is called the contract, that is the hallmark of what is called the contract of protection, or dimma, zumma. And the dimmi, the protected person, is getting a kind of protection like you may recall if you have ever seen the movie The Godfather or you've read about the Mafia. You may recall the protection money that uh, the Mafia guys would come in to, to a store and say, you know, you've got a very nice establishment here and beautiful picture window in the front. And, you know, it would be terrible if somebody would come in here and blow, break that window. And so, you know, you give us a couple hundred dollars every week and uh, we'll make sure it doesn't happen. Same kind of protection here that they would pay this tax, the jizya, with willing submission and feel themselves subdued, the verse says. In other words, the tax itself is a sign of their submission. And then Islamic law mandated that they show their submission by accepting various humiliating and discriminatory regulations that denied them equal rights under the law. And then they would be protected. They would be allowed to practice their religions, but within these very, very clear limits. Some of the limits included that non-Muslims or the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, they uh, could not repair their houses of worship or build new ones. So their, their communities were in a perpetual state of decline. They could not hold authority over Muslims, so they could only hold the most menial jobs in society. Because if you can't be the boss, even in your tiny little shop, you know, with your nice picture window, then you're, you're, you're relegated to jobs where there is no boss or where you are always on the low end of the, of the uh, spectrum. For example, in Pakistan to this day, the colloquial term for Christians, the slang word for Christians is sweepers, as in street sweepers, because that's the only kind of job they can get. It's just the, the kind of jobs that nobody else wants to do that are at the lowest rung of society. So having accepted all this, 
then the Christians and the Jews are in a state of submission. They feel themselves subdued, as the verse says. Now, what does all this have to do with the Islamic State? This is exactly what the Islamic State did when they went into Mosul and other areas where there were a large concentration of Christians in Iraq at the time that they took over. They went into Mosul, they marked the Christians' homes with the noon, and they went and knocked on their doors at a certain point and said, we are demanding that you pay the jizya and accept submission to the Muslim rule. The Christians were living in Iraq, obviously, in an area where the laws of dimitude, although they are part of Islamic law and founded in the Quran, they had not been enforced for 150 years. The Ottoman Empire, which you may have read about in history class, was the last caliphate. And the Ottoman Empire was the, did you ever hear the term the sick man of Europe? If you studied this, and it was called the sick man of Europe because it was an empire in steadily increasing weakness and decline for several centuries, actually. In the middle of the 18th, uh, 19th century, it had a dispute with Russia and asked for French and British help against the Russians. And the French and British said, sure, we'll help you, but you have to abolish the, dim the dimma. You have to give equal rights to the Jews and Christians. And the Ottoman Turks, they didn't really have any choice because they were the sick man of Europe. They were in a very weak position. So they granted equal rights to the Jews and Christians. This was in contravention of Islamic law, but they had no choice. So the, after that came a period of colonial rule when the empire fell after World War I and the caliphate was abolished in 1924, followed by a period of secular, relatively secular rule. So these rules that the Islamic State was trying to enforce on the Iraqis, on the Iraqi Christians, hadn't been enforced for 150 years. And so the Christians said, what are you talking about? We're not going to pay the jizya and we're not going to submit. We want to live as we've always lived. They were then either killed, forced out of the area, or forced to submit. And there have been uh, indications, videos and uh, photographs of the collection of the jizya from the Christians and them making this submission to the Muslim rule. But most of them were killed or got out. The Archbishop of Mosul, he said, I have lost my entire diocese to Islam. And if people don't wake up, the same thing's going to happen in Europe and America. So when the Islamic State persecutes Christians, it did so in very, very scrupulous adherence to this passage, chapter 9, verse 29, and to the attendant Islamic laws that mandate the subjugation of the people of the book. So in that sense also, they're acting in a completely Islamic way. And then, of course, there is the very, very lurid and uh, horrifying practice that they have of kidnapping women who are not Muslims, Yazidis and Christians, and pressing them into sex slavery. Now, you might think, well, this certainly this could not be Islamic. No world, major world religion that we read about in major world religions class could possibly sanction such behavior. Well, unfortunately, this too is something in which the Islamic State is very scrupulously Islamic. The Quran says in chapter 4, verse 3, marry women that seem good to you, two or three or four. If you fear that you will not be able to treat them justly, then marry only one. Or take from those whom your right hands possess. Those whom your right hands possess. Now, who are they? What on earth does that mean? We go to other passages to find out. Chapter 4, verse 24 says, forbidden to you. This is in the passage that is telling men who they can sleep with and who they can't. And it says, forbidden to you are all married women. That is, don't sleep with married women. Don't commit adultery, in other words. Also forbidden to you are all married women, except those whom your right hands possess. And so it seems clear that those whom your right hands possess are women who are somehow possessed, owned, and are able to be used in this way. And where did they come from? Chapter 33, verse 50 is very clear about that when it says, O prophet, we have made lawful for you your wives whose bridal dues you have paid and 
the slave girls you possess from among the prisoners of war. The slave girls you possess from among the prisoners of war are those whom your right hands possess. And thus, we're talking about women who can be captured who are not Muslim and who can be used as sex slaves. It's a very unpleasant topic, but it has to be discussed since it did become such an international scandal. You may recall that when another jihad terror group did it in Nigeria a couple years ago, that Michelle Obama held up the hashtag, bring back our girls, and it was a big uh, uh, cause for a little while until everybody forgot about it. Now, I want to make sure that you uh, understand that I am not just making all this up. I have the Quran with me today that has commentary by Sayyid Abu Allah Maududi. Maududi was a Pakistani Islamic scholar and uh, jihad theorist. He died in 1979. He wrote a lot of books. He was very influential. As a matter of fact, internationally influential and renowned. If you were to uh, go to your local Islamic bookstore, or log on to your account at islamicbookstore.com or uh, wherever you go for Islamic books, you will find that Maududi's books are there. That I guarantee you, any Islamic bookstore is going to be stocking this man's work. He's very mainstream. And any online bookstore, you can check this out, will be stocking his works, Maududi. Now, I carry this Quran around with me, because not just for inspiration, but for the commentary from Maududi because he is so mainstream, he gives us an insight as to how Muslims themselves understand these passages. So he says that the captives of the right hand, those whom the right hands possess, this expression denotes slave girls, i.e. female captives of war who are distributed by the state among individuals when no exchange of prisoners of war takes place. Now, doesn't that sound exactly like what the Islamic State has done in this case? And so we have beheading, we have the mistreatment of Christians, we have the slave girls, and in all three cases, we see that the Islamic State is acting in complete accord with Islam, with Islamic teachings as in the Quran, the holy book of Islam. We see that this Islamic case, and those are just three examples, if time permitted, we could go on and on with the Quran study, but I think that this is clear enough. If this is out of accord, with the Quran, out of accord with Islam, then it remains to be explained why these 30,000 Muslims from around the world have joined up with this group. And you might say, well, wait, no, wait, wait a minute, uh, 30,000 out of 1.2 billion Muslims, that's a very small number. But consider an analogy then. Imagine if 30,000 Christians from around the world had gone to some area that was controlled by a Christian group that maybe called itself the Christian state. And they would go and, and, and kill people while screaming, Jesus is Lord. And would tell people that when they killed and raped and destroyed things and laid waste, they were doing it all because it was what, the, what Jesus Christ taught. Now, in the first place, do you think that such a group could even get started if it was so drastically out of accord with what Jesus actually taught? That seems unlikely. Also, if it were in place, what do you think would be the reaction of the churches, whatever churches, Protestant, Catholic, what have you? I would guess that they would be horrified and would condemn the group and would be instituting programs in every church to teach young Christians why they should not join up with this group and why it has nothing to do with the real teachings of Christianity. Does that seem reasonable? Do you know that there's not a single mosque or Islamic school in the United States or anywhere else in the world that has any kind of program to teach young Muslims that they should reject the teachings of the Islamic State? Meanwhile, 30,000 Muslims have gone over there. Don't you think that if they thought this was a problem, they'd be trying to stop it? And so we come to the core of the problem, and that is that the Islamic State is very Islamic. It is quintessentially Islamic. It is not the only way to understand Islam, but it has a vision of Islam that is compelling enough to attract thousands of adherents worldwide. And it's not just those 30,000. There have also been numerous jihad terror plots that have been uncovered over the last year, in which, in the United States I'm talking about, in which the plotter says that they are an adherent of the Islamic State. And they were doing it because the Islamic State has detailed plans to 
sow blood and mayhem on the streets of the United States. They are sending people over here and they are planning to have mass murder on a scale unimaginable. For example, you may recall the Boston Marathon bombing where three people were killed, many more were injured, some were maimed for life, and this was a, a terrible and traumatic incident. The Islamic State wants to have one of those every day, and they're actively working toward it. Last February, they threatened, we are going to flood Europe with 500,000 refugees. Have you noticed that Europe is being flooded with refugees? Not only is exactly what they said was going to happen happening, but also the Lebanese education minister, the education minister for the government of Lebanon, a couple weeks ago he said that among the refugees from Syria in his country, he estimates that there are as many as 20,000 active jihadis. 20,000. How many have already gone into Europe? The Islamic State announced as soon as the refugee crisis began, which is well over a month ago now, that they had already gotten 4,000 jihadis into Europe and more were coming every day. Then Barack Obama says, we're going to bring over 100,000 Syrians this year and 100,000 next year to help with this refugee crisis. You know how many Syrian refugees Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states have taken? None. Zero. Not a one. Now, you've got to think, wait a minute, that's really weird. Why would that be the case? You're talking about people of a common language, although there are serious di differences between Arabic as spoken in certain areas and certain others. Still, it's Arabic. They can, they can work it out. Similar culture, and they're not taking any. And they're instead flooding into Europe where the languages and the cultures are different and into the United States. Now, why? Why did Saudi Arabia say, we're not going to take any of these people? Because, they said, there are terrorists among them. And we can't tell who are the terrorists and who are the genuine refugees. But when people have raised similar objections about the refugee influx into Europe and it's coming soon into the United States, then people say, oh, you're just racist, bigoted Islamophobes. And you don't care. You're hard-hearted against this refugee crisis. How dare you? Well, I think the, that, that it would be a great idea to uh, send these people to Saudi Arabia. They've got plenty of room. And to Qatar and Bahrain and all the rest of them, the Emirates, they, uh, they would be much more at home there. Do you also know that 80% of these so-called refugees are not actually Syrians, and yet Syria is the only war zone? 80% are not Syrians. They're pretending to be Syrians. They have fake Syrian passports. But their accents give them away that they're actually Moroccan, Algerian, whatever else. And so it's all useful to recall all this in light of the fact that the Islamic State said, we're going to flood Europe with 500,000 refugees just a few months ago. In their manuals, they have a lot of e-books, a lot of publications that are uh, chilling to read. And in one of them, it says to, it's a, it's a, it's a guide for uh, their operatives in the United States. And they say, blend in. Don't carry around a Quran. Don't wear a beard. So you know I'm not with ISIS, because I've got both a Quran and a beard. But <laughs> don't carry around a Quran. Don't wear a beard. Don't go to mosque. Blend in with Western society. Go have a beer every now and then. And we'll call you when we need you. The idea is not to attract suspicion, not to attract undue attention and then to strike when the time comes. Now, the problem that we face at the top in dealing with this threat is the denial that I spoke about at the beginning, that Barack Obama says the Islamic State is neither Islamic nor state, and he discounts its Islamic character. Now, you understand, it's an adage as old as warfare that you may have heard. Know your enemy. If you don't understand your enemy, you will not possibly be able to defeat him. Because you don't know, if you don't know who he is, you don't know why he's doing what he's doing, which will give you a clue as to what he might do next and how best to defeat him. This is shown very vividly in this disagreement about Syria. Because Obama insists that this has nothing to do with Islam, he thinks this group will go away 
if Assad is gone? What will really happen once Assad is gone? Assad controls, as I said at the beginning, southern Syria, southern Syria bordering on Lebanon and Israel. The chief beneficiary of his removal will be the Islamic State. They are fighting against Assad. They do want to get rid of him. But they have a global vision. They consider themselves not only the sole legitimate government for Muslims worldwide, but for non-Muslims. The, they are an, a force that is going to continue to expand until it is stopped by force, just like Nazi Germany. The Nazis were going to continue taking territory until somebody made it impossible for them to do so. And so it is with the Islamic State. So you remove Assad, and the Islamic State is at the borders of Lebanon and Israel, and pretty soon you've got a much wider conflict than what you have now. Meanwhile, Spencer, in his introduction, he very uh, kindly noted that I train FBI and military and intelligence groups about the nature of the jihad threat, the beliefs of the enemy. I'm here to tell you, however, I used to do that. I don't do that anymore because Barack Obama stopped me. On October 19th, 2011, 57 Muslim and South Asian organizations wrote to John Brennan, who is now the head of the CIA, demanding that I, by name, be removed. And I thought, well, I'm flattered that you noticed. But on the other hand, uh, I understand the, the implications of this. It's not just about me. It's about the fact that they were pushing, and they got it. They were pushing for the removal of all mention of Islam and Jihad from counter-terror training. And so, if you can imagine this, now if you go into the FBI and they start telling you about counter-terror, they'll tell you about right-wing extremists. You know, that's you. And well, white supremacists and people like that. But they won't tell you anything about Islamic Jihadis. Meanwhile, the Islamic State is determined to destroy the United States of America by subversion and infiltration. And FBI agents are not trained in the slightest degree as to what their beliefs and motives and goals are. And so it's very good that you're here at YAF because it is a very hopeful sign for the future that as you go on to positions of influence in politics, in academia, wherever you may go, it is your responsibility, and it's not just something I wish you would do, but it's your responsibility to turn back, to clear away this fog of delusion and misinformation that is coming out of Washington, and to demand the truth and accountability from our elected officials. The, the Islamic State very frequently says, we will win because we love death more than you love life. We will win because we love death more than you love life. Well, that's the sign that we're going to win because life always triumphs over death and the uh, forces of destruction, hatred, violence, and evil, they never prevail in the long run. That was the lesson of Ronald Reagan when he knew the Soviet Union would not last and would, be, would tip over if it were given a good enough push. Well, it's up to us to give the Islamic State that push. And the first thing we have to do is to start speaking about it honestly, just as Reagan spoke honestly about the Soviet threat when most people feared to do so. And so as you do proceed on to college and beyond, I exhort you to stand for the truth no matter what the cost and never to give up or to give in to the forces of intimidation that will come at you and try to keep you from telling these truths and standing for these truths. And the one thing you know is, is that it's easy. You know, uh, it's easy to tell the truth. It's hard to be a liar. You have to have a very good memory to be a liar. But to, be, to, to stand for the truth, there's nothing easier. And so I hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. Spencer has a microphone. If you have questions, comments, death fatwas, whatever, I'm right here. Plenty of time. Hi, my name is Reagan Day, and I'm from Southern California. Um, my question is, uh, how did you get involved um, in, I guess you would consider this foreign affairs, um, or, and so how did your career get a start, and um, how would you advise um, people like us um, to kind of continue in your footsteps and to improve this country? Well, you know, one, every person's abilities and talents and interests are different, and so uh, my experience may not be exemplary. I uh, got into this 
because of a personal interest, um, my family is from that part of the world, and my grandparents actually were exiled from the last caliphate, the Ottoman Empire, for declining the invitation to convert to Islam, because it was convert to Islam or get out or be killed. And they did actually kill my great-grandfather in the process of the rest of them getting out, but some of them got out as witness my being here today. But in any case, the, uh, what I was wondering was, why did that happen? You know, my grandparents could never tell me when I was a kid why exactly they were exiled, and I wanted to know, and I started to research these things. And then uh, I was also writing and uh, working for some outfits in Washington in the 90s that uh, uh, were cons where I was consulting about these issues, uh, and because obviously my personal interest coincided with geopolitical events, as you know, who would have expected, but that's the way it happened. And so uh, I ended up writing about this and not doing anything else. And you know, one thing leads to another and then you're there. What I would uh, advise you is whatever you can do, whatever talents that you have, you immediately try to devote them to working for the defense of freedom in some way. That in college, the pressures are gonna be very great. Are you, you're not in college yet, right? This is a high school group? Yes? Yes? yes. Well, you'll be in college before too long and uh, I hope you remember that all the colleges, unless you go to some conservative Christian college or something like that, all the colleges are bad. And they're all going to try to destroy you. But don't be downhearted because, like I say, it's very easy if you're standing for the truth. And to go into college and immediately start to work to turn back this fog of error and deceit and disinformation that covers this topic and so many others. And don't let yourself be intimidated above all. Always stand straight. The thing about a bully, and the left is a bully, it, uh, the left and the Muslim groups on campus, they will try to bully and intimidate you. Remember what they told you in fifth grade or whenever. You stand up to a bully. That's the way to beat him. You may even have to fight, metaphorically or physically, but I'm not advising physical, phys uh, physical fighting. I'm just saying you, you, will have to, you may have to stand and stand under great pressure. But don't ever give in. Giving in only emboldens the bully and only encourages the bully to be more bullying. And so the most useful advice I can give you for the short term is that go onto campus, be an activist, don't be afraid, even if you're rad drastically outnumbered and you will be. Stand for the truth and you will open people's eyes and never let yourself be intimidated. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Adriana, and I have a question about radical Islam. I hear a lot about it, and I was wondering, is there a difference between Islam and radical Islam, or is all Islam radical? All Islam is radical, but not all Muslims are radical Muslims. It's important to make the distinction between Islam and Muslims. I expect some of you here are Christians, and yet you might do things now and again that are not actually in line with Christianity. And it's the same thing with Muslims. It's the same thing with anybody. There are some people who are very knowledgeable and devout, and some people who are not, but they all call themselves by the name of the religion. And so the teachings of the religion are one thing, and how any individual practices it is another. There are millions of Muslims worldwide, and we can be glad of it, who have no interest in waging jihad. They just want to have a job and raise a family and live a life and not be bothered, as millions of people who are not Muslim also feel the same way. But if you ask them, they'll call themselves Muslim. Sure, absolutely. But that is a separate question from what Islam teaches. Islam teaches warfare against unbelievers, the subjugation of unbelievers, the beating of disobedient women, the institutionalized oppression of women and non-Muslims. It teaches all these things. They're all in the Quran and in the example of Muhammad. Islam teaches those things. The fact that many Muslims don't care and, are, and, and live wonderful lives does not change the fact that those teachings are there. And it's unfortunate that those teachings are there because then the Islamic State and Al-Qaeda and other jihad groups can and do point to those teachings to make recruits among peaceful Muslims. So the answer is there is no Islam that's not radical in the generally understood meaning of the word. In other words, there is no Islam that teaches peaceful coexistence between Muslims and non-Muslims on an indefinite basis, and equality of rights of Muslims and non-Muslims before the law as an ideal. 
There is no form of Islam that teaches that. But there are plenty of Muslims who live that way. Yes, Any sir. Um, my name is Abraham Martin from Hello. Missouri. My uh, presidential candidate, Dr. Ben Carson, he recently came under attack for making some comments about um, a potential uh, Islamic yes. uh, president. Could you possibly comment on that situation? Sure. Uh, Carson said that he would not want to see a Muslim president. He did not say that Muslims should not run for president or should be barred from running for president. There was a lot of misreporting about this. As I have alluded to during the talk, there's a lot of misinformation about Islam, people teaching that Islam is a religion of peace and all this nonsense. And there's a lot of misinformation about pretty much any story regarding this issue, including the Carson one. Dr. Carson did not say anything in violation of the First Amendment or the idea many, many people said, doesn't he know there's, a religious, there's no religious test in the First Amendment? You can't have a religious test for political office? Yeah, he wasn't talking about that. He was talking about Sharia. Sharia is Islamic law. Islamic law limits the freedom of speech. You can't criticize Islam. You'll be, you'll be killed if you criticize Islam or Muhammad or the Quran. You cannot have equality of rights, as I just said, with non-Muslims, for, for non-Muslims, for women, for other groups as well. These things are at variance with constitutional principles, and Dr. Carson is aware of that in a way that I haven't seen any of the other candidates being. And so he spoke about the difficulty that a presidential candidate who was Muslim, or I should say a president who was Muslim, would have in being, if he were a knowledgeable and devout Muslim. Could he obey Islamic law and uphold, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution as the oath of office says that the president must do? Can't do both. Either he's got to discard Islamic law or not obey his oath because Islamic law is at variance with the Constitution. Now, there were many, many commentators and pundits and TV talking heads who said, uh, this is a terrible thing. Only racist, bigoted Islamophobes think that uh, Islamic law is incompatible with the Constitution. Okay, well, look at the areas of the world where Islamic law is in force. Saudi Arabia, Iran, Sudan, Somalia, Pakistan. Do, they, do, do women have equal rights in those places? Not a one. Do they uphold the freedom of speech? Can you criticize even Islam? Nope, not in, not in any of them. Do non-Muslims have absolutely equal rights with Muslims in those countries? Absolutely not. In Saudi Arabia, if you show up at the airport with a Bible, they'll seize it from you and throw it in the trash. You can't even have one there, privately. So, Dr. Carson was entirely correct, and everything he said was true. He also spoke about taqiyya, which is a principle of Shiite Islam. Shiites are 10 to 15 percent of Muslims worldwide. And uh, it was a bit unfortunate that he used the term, because then people said, oh, taqiyya, it's only a Shiite thing. The Sunnis don't do it. Sunnis are 85 to 90 percent of the Muslims. But actually, the Quran says, and taqiyya is religious deception, lying to people, in other words, misleading them for the good of Islam. And he was saying a, a, a Muslim president could only if he upholds Sharia, he could only take the oath of office if he's employing taqiyya, religious deception. Now, the fact is that religious deception is not a Shiite thing. It's not called taqiyya in Sunni Islam, but it's in the Quran. The Quran says, let not believers take unbelievers as their friends and protectors in preference to believers, unless you're doing it to guard yourselves against them. That's chapter 3, verse 28, for those keeping score. And the clause, unless they're doing it to guard yourselves against them, that's glossed in commentaries on the Quran, mainstream Muslim commentaries on the Quran, as we smile in the faces of some people, but behind their backs we curse them. And we pretend to be on the same side as our enemies when under pressure in order to protect Islam. So Dr. Carson was entirely correct. Any others? Yes, sir. My name is Raymond Maddox, and I'm from Maine. My question is, there's all this evidence you just gave us as to why they're a threat. Can you explain the left's <clears throat> refusal to do anything about it? Why don't they recognize that it's a threat? I think the left hates America. <laughs> and because the left hates America, it sees the Islamic State that hates America and thinks the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And you might say, well, how could you say that? What a terrible thing to say, the left hates America. Well, when have you ever heard any prominent leftist spokesman ever talk about the necessity to defend this country or the value of American principles? Ever. Even once. 
anybody. Nope. And yet, and yet every opposite force, every force that breaks down the principles on which the nation was founded, every force that genuinely loves America, they scorn and ridicule and denigrate. Look how the left reacted to Ronald Reagan with his unabashed and unapologetic patriotism. And it's the same thing today, even more virulent today. So I think that's part of it. Also, they're both authoritarians. You know, I uh, have noticed over the years that leftist spokesmen, they won't engage in discussion or debate with conservatives. They only ridicule. You'll find this when you go to college. They only will heap scorn upon what you're doing. They will not engage you on the level of ideas. If they did, they know they'd lose. And so they avoid doing so at all costs. But they will try to shut you down. They will say you're racist and bigoted and sexist and homophobic and Islamophobic and everything else. And so you have to be shut down. You have to be forcibly silenced. And they'll try to do that to you on college campuses as well. And the thing is, that's an authoritarian impulse. They can't handle debate. They can't handle dissent. And so they have to shut you down. That's what the Soviets did. You know, That's what all authoritarian, totalitarian states do. And so the left is authoritarian. Islamic, the Islamic law is authoritarian mandating death for those who criticize Islam or the Quran or Muhammad. So I think they, they, they are shared worldview. They both are creating an earthly paradise based on repression. You know, the left, the, the communists will tell you, we want to build the workers' paradise, a just society, where everybody has everything equal. And those who are unequal will kill them. This is how all communist societies have always worked. And it's the same thing with Islamic law. They want to create the earthly paradise of Sharia, and those who get out of line will be stoned to death or their hands amputated or what have you. So I think they see in each other a kinship. Yes, uh, yes, hello. hello. Uh, my name is Matthew Weimer, I'm from New York. And uh, I was wondering, uh, at the beginning you were talking about how uh, Obama has his way of uh, dealing with ISIS and how Putin has his way. What would be your way with dealing with ISIS? Well, I think that Putin is right. This is not to say that Russia is uh, is absolutely right in all ways, and not to say that Putin is a good man in every way, but certainly in this particular case, when he called for an international alliance against terrorism, I'm all for that, and I think Obama should have taken him up on it. And I've been calling since 9-11 for an international alliance against the jihad force, a coalition of all the countries that are threatened by Islamic jihad. You know, what we have today is a coalition of all the countries that are threatened by the Soviet Union. That's what NATO is and all the other arrangements and alliances that the United States has. They're based on the Cold War. Well, I'm here to tell you the Cold War is over. It's time to reconfigure our national, international alliances. We need to understand that countries like Turkey and Pakistan are on the side of the jihad force. You know, we've been giving billions of dollars every year to Pakistan to fight Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, and they have funneled a large amount of that money to Al-Qaeda and the Taliban. And the Turks, we keep saying, will you fight ISIS? Will you fight ISIS? Please, please, will you fight ISIS? And they finally said, after delaying for a year, okay, we'll fight ISIS. And then they bombed the Kurds who were fighting ISIS. We should stop pr uh, pretending these people are our allies and make real alliances with countries that really are threatened by this jihad in the same way as we are. Strengthen our alliance with Israel that Obama has so strongly damaged and make alliances. Why is it so terrible and thinkable, the idea of making an alliance with Russia on this, on this issue, when the United States fought alongside the Soviet Union against the Nazis in World War II? And today's Russia is not as bad as the Soviet Union. So we need to do that. We need to uh, call upon the mosques and Islamic schools in the United States to do what I said earlier that they're not doing. That is, institute programs to teach against this understanding of Islam. They all condemn it. They say they reject it. They say it's not going on there. OK, put in this program. Let it be transparent and inspectable and honest. And if you don't, then we're going to have to be investigating what's going on and what's being taught in these mosques. Those are the two main ones. There are quite a few many more, and I will be telling you more if I'm elected. My yes, name sir. is James Tasik. I'm also from New York. Uh, with the line of work that you're in, how often do you receive uh, threats, or how often are you in danger of receiving threats because of your work? 
Well, I do receive death threats pretty regularly, but I wouldn't worry. I don't think many people know I'm here. And uh, anyway, I'm not worried about it. I do re I've received more death threats than I've ever counted. I never bothered to count them, but I've received many, many of them over the years. The thing about it is that the guy who says he's going to kill you is not going to kill you. He's just getting his jollies from telling you he's going to kill you. And then he can go away thinking, I have done my bit for jihad today. <laughs> but uh, the problem with death threats is that they, sh they indicate that there are people out there who want to kill you. But I guarantee you, the guy who kills me, he's not going to tell me beforehand. He'll just show up one day. But I'm not really worried about it because I found out actually a few years ago that even if I stop this work, I'm still going to die. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a funny thing, but it's a terminal sentence that, uh, that I think all of us actually have. And so we have to bear in mind, as a matter of fact, in light of some of the things I was trying to explain, perhaps not so well earlier, that uh, it's never, ever a good bargain to uh, give in to evil, to give in to intimidation. It's always worth it to stand up for the truth no matter what. None of us has the next moment guaranteed. I don't mean to be morbid. I'm just being realistic. You don't know what's going to happen in your life today or tomorrow or a week down the road or a year. God forbid anything happened to you, and I hope you all live to be 150. But you just, you're still going to die one day. And you should die knowing that you, you did the right thing and that you stood instead of cowered. The worst thing you could possibly be is somebody who cowers and submits and surrenders for a few more years of life. The coward is going to die just as much as the hero. And so be a hero. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll be here all night. No, not really. Uh, any others? Yes, doctor. Okay, so my name is Chase, and I'm from Manhattan Beach. I was one, so last year on the news, they said that Bill Maher had, there was basically a bunch of talk about Islamophobia, and Ben Affleck was on it. What do you have to say to him about his beliefs on Islamophobia? About ben, to Ben Affleck? Yeah. He's a moron. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you about Islamophobia. Islamophobia is a made-up word that was made up in order to intimidate people into thinking there's something wrong with resisting jihad terrorism. The, the, the idea that Ben Affleck would be angry with Bill Maher for saying that there's some problem with Islam just shows how much this, how thick this fog of misinformation that I keep referring to is. That people think that if you say there's a problem with Islamic terrorism, that's more of a problem than with right-wing extremists or Christian extremists or what have you, then they think that you're a racist, bigoted Islamophobe. Well, look, there's over 25,000 jihad terror attacks in the world, around the world, since 9-11. How many terror attacks have been committed in that span by Christians who did shout Jesus is Lord and then blew themselves up or something like that? Not too many. Actually, none. 20,000, 25,000 versus zero. And yet people like Ben Affleck will say, if you don't say that the problem is violent extremism, as Barack Obama calls it, which is like calling it a sandwich. I mean, it's nothing. There's nothing there. <laughs> violent extremist what? I could be a violent extremist piano player who just plays piano 22 <laughs> hours a day and I never stop and I don't want to get up off the keys. I mean, there's nothing to that, you see. But you can't identify it as Islamic because that would be Islamophobic. Well, Islamophobia is a word that was coined by Muslim Brotherhood groups precisely to make you scared to talk about the problem with Islam. And I'll tell you how effective it has been. In 2007, there was a plot, a jihad plot, against Fort Dix in New Jersey, Army base. And they were going to go into Fort Dix and kill as many American soldiers as they could before they themselves were killed and then they go to paradise with the virgins and all that. And yes, that's in the Quran. So, they were foiled. How were they foiled? This is where the high school connection comes in. They went to a video store because they had all these bloody jihad videos, beheadings and such, blow, explosions and all sorts of things, and they had them on VHS tapes. You remember VHS tapes? Maybe your dad has one or your grandfather, I don't know. But anyway, 
they wanted them on, put them on DVD. And so they asked the, uh, this guy, 17-year-old kid, and they asked him, can you put our VHS tapes on DVD? And he said, okay. So he's doing the job. And I should tell you also that these are Albanian Muslims. Albania, as you may have heard in high school, amid all the talk about social justice, you may have heard that Albania is a country in Eastern Europe that is majority Muslim. And the people there are blonde white folks. So these were not Pakistanis, okay? Albanians. And they go in to get their jihad videos transferred to DVD. 17-year-old guy, Brian Morgenstern, He's doing the job, and I don't know how this works. I never worked in a video store, but apparently he's seeing it go by. And so he sees all this beheadings and explosions and all this blood and gore and bloodlust, and he's a little bit alarmed. So he went to his boss, and he said, dude, I'm seeing this weird stuff on these videos. Should I like call the police? Or would that be racist? True story. Now, I told you they were Albanians so that you would know there's no possible way this could be racist. They were white guys. They want to blow things up. He thinks if I stop them from blowing things up, would that be racist? Why did he think that? Because of the same kind of thing that happened with Bill Maher and Ben Affleck, that he's been taught, he's been, it's been pounded into him like it's been pounded into all of us for years, that if you resist jihad terror, if you oppose jihad terror, if you even call it jihad terror, there's something wrong with you. You're a racist, you're a bigot, you're an Islamophobe. This has been a concerted campaign, it's been very effective. And it's just, it's, it's disinformation, no less so than the communist propaganda that Ronald Reagan was fighting. And no less, no less real, no more, uh, I mean, no more real. It's completely fantastic. The re reality is that there is a problem with Islam, there is a problem with jihad, and that to oppose it is to stand for freedom, not to be in the least bigoted or racist in any slightest degree. And that's one of the things that you need to stand up for when you get to college and say, you know, stop the nonsense. We are standing for the oppressed non-Muslims in Muslim countries, the oppressed women in Muslim countries, and so on. We're the ones standing for human rights, not you morons. Anyway. <clears throat> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Because I, I wanted to, so I want, I needed to ask that question for someone who, who's like big on that. Okay. Will you go back and tell him Islamophobia is a fiction designed to bamboozle him into lying supine before his oppressors? <laughs> True fact. One more. Time to go. Okay, well, it's been great. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Thank you very much. I know I, I definitely learned a lot during that presentation. Uh, just a reminder, I know we already mentioned this, but make sure you guys are filling out your evaluations. Uh, they're in the back of your binder. Those are very helpful so that we can... Uh, we don't, Make sure that we use those to make the next conference even better. We are going to take um, a two-minute break, and then we'll be back for our next speaker.